Hey everybody, this is Kim from Read It Again Bookstore, and today I'm joined in alphabetical order, by the way. Uh, Gideon Marcus, Lisa Yasnick, and Marie. Oh man, we were so busy. <laughs> we were so busy before this started talking that I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your name. I am so really sorry. <laughs> so okay, Marie de Bur Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, guys. So I am so excited about this panel. I've been thinking about it all week. I know my sci-fi book club is like pumped. And so you guys all worked on two books that talk about historical, like women in speculative fiction. So we have uh, Rediscovery and The Future is Female. And I wanted to bring you guys together because I felt your, your stories kind of overlap. And I've talked to I've talked to Gideon and I've talked to Lisa before. We've had events with them before, and they were freaking awesome. And I'm like, I need to bring these two freaking awesome people together so they can talk about a really fascinating subject. And then Gideon's like, Oh, I cannot discuss this unless Marie's here. So that is <laughs> that is how this happened. Okay. So, hi guys. <laughs> hi. Hi. Hello. Let me introduce you all, and then we'll get to we'll get started. Um, I'll start with Lisa. Um, I'm not good at reading aloud, so please forgive me. Lisa Yasnick is professor of science fiction um, studies in the School of Literature, Media, and Communications at Georgia Tech. She, when she reaches, researches and teaches science fiction as a global language, crossing centuries, continents, and cultures. She is particularly interested in issues of gender, race, science, technology in science fiction across media, as well as the recovery of lost voices in science fiction history and the discovery of new voices from around the globe. Um, she has written, her books include The Self-Wired Technology in Subjectivity and Contemporary American Narrative. That's a title, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's a story behind that we can tell <laughs> later, so. <laughs> Galactic Suburbia, Rediscovering Women's Science Fiction, Sisters of Tomorrow, the first women in science fiction. Her ideas about science fiction as a premier story form of modern, 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 has been featured in Washington Post, Food and Wine Magazine, USA Today, um, Dame Cameron's Story of Science Fiction, um, and as a president of the Science Fiction Research Association, Yasner currently serves as the editor of America Library, Library of America, and <laughs> Anyway, she's awesome. That is what that paragraph is, sums up to be. Oh, she's super smart. You. She knows her things. She's a professor and she's super cool. Okay, Gideon, your turn. I'm surprised she's slumming with me. <laughs> no. Okay, Gideon Marcus is a professional space historian, author, and public speaker with a passion for teaching. He literally wrote the book on early automated American space program in a series of articles for Quest Science Quarterly. Gideon is the founder of Sterling Award winning of the Sterling Award winning and Hugo nominated web project Galactic Journey. And I'll post a link to that in the um, comments. Um, it's really cool. Um, the mission of which is to rediscover the lost voices of science fiction and the space race, making the past relevant today. To that end, he has assembled a diverse team of 20 individuals covering, covering science fact and fiction across the globe as it existed exactly 55 years ago. So basically he lives in 1955 and then comes and visits us, right? That's That explains the tie in the suit. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can still wear that and be now. Yeah, but I'm not. And th that's why I also have the Isaac Asimov glasses, which I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, leaving off out of vanity, but because they're new and pinch. Oh, okay. His educational series lectures panels performed at conventions and public venues across the West Coast are must-see events. I agree, um, both entertaining and enlightening. Okay, Marie, who I just met today, and I'm so excited. Um, she is a digital library developer for Case Western uh, Reserve University and has con conducted a st statistical study of the appearance of female seeming names in fiction writing credits in major speculative fiction magazines from 1930 to 2020, 2010. An article based on her research will appeal, appear in Analog soon. Congratulations. Um, besides selling 50 odd short stories, 21, 20 some poems and a few comics, um, Marie Vambert has been a a, some, a metal. I've been a medieval squire. Yeah. I know. I put a lot of hard words in there. 
Yeah, ridden 17% of the roller coasters in the United States and has played O-line and D-line for the Cleveland Fusion Women's Tackle football team. <laughs> she has been translated into French, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Her work has been called the embodiment, embodiment, embodiment of science fiction should be by the Oxford, Oxford Culture Review. Woo! Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I write science fiction. There you go. <laughs> On here who have less of a bio because you guys are just so impressive um we got some comments here thanks for hosting this um by the way if you guys have any comments and you want to post them into the well if you have something to say you can post a comment and i will put it into the video so there we go space traveler lisa with wine yes hey, <laughs> <laughs> okay so where should we start um we were talking before we started about the value of reading short stories mm. and why we should read these these old stories. Why why are they relevant today? I, I love that question. That was Lisa who said that. So let's start. Lisa, you, you came up with it. This is my question. Really, so I can't ask it to all of you first okay. before I answer. So I'd like to actually, um, because all of us, all all of us who are here, are especially of course um, Gideon and myself, but, but well, actually Marie too, because you've been doing this work, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've all been looking and thinking about these stories, and maybe what we could do is like, is there? I'm curious for you. I have found that surprisingly, a lot of those stories, even as they feel very distant in some ways, remain surprisingly relevant today, and in some ways some of them I feel have become actually more relevant during the pandemic because we're in this moment of flux, right? And women have often written about what it feels like to be caught in moments of flux that are not of their own making. So I guess that'd be my question for, for both of you or, and for you, Kim too, maybe yeah. is, or for anyone out in the audience, have any of you read like great old stories by women or maybe even men, that's fine too. Everyone has a gender, right? Um, <laughs> that feel relevant to this moment. I have a great story by a woman, which is why I asked this question, but I'm looking for other stories by other people. Well, I can tell you why I read old stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Because it's good. Um, I would say <laughs> the same proportion of stuff was good back then as it is now. Uh, it has the virtue of there being less of it, which means that you can read all of it for any given year. Um, but I guess the, if I were to say it in a sentence, I don't want people in 55 years to go, N.K. Jemison, Kelly Robson, who are they? Mm -hmm. I don't read anything before 2030. Mm -hmm. um, timeless good fiction is timeless good fiction. Um, and in my experience running the journey, uh, women write about 5 to 10% of what gets published but 20 to 25 percent of what's worth reading that's true yeah i definitely agree when i was working on my research i went back and i read a lot of old magazines and um i'm gonna i'm gonna be mean and say that actually there is a lot of crap in the old pulps and i'm like oh my god this would never make it out of the slush pile today but I got so I was really excited when I saw women's names because those stories tended to be better. I mean, just mm -hmm. to have more, uh, C.L. Moore was writing just amazing stories that had complexity and emotion and interiority of the uh, her heroines and heroes mm -hmm. before many of her uh, male colleagues were. Not that, not that all of them weren't. There was some, I mean, there's good shit. I, I don't know if we have a swearing problem. Sorry, oh, whatever. <laughs> I swear. Clearly, we do. Clearly, I do. I have a swearing problem. Um, but yeah, as to specific stories, I'm kind of racking my brains for something specific. Um, I was grateful that this project introduced me to a lot of good writers that I hadn't heard about. Um, Clifford D. Simic and Mac Reynolds and lots of other guys that I've read, Algis Budry is pretty good. Um, but I really, really enjoyed reading James Tiptree Jr.'s stuff. Um, it's just stellar from the very beginning. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking, I know, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I know Joanna Russ, I think, right, she always said that that was one of the, the main things that even when women aren't writing feminist science fiction, that they often do tend to really 
up the ante and the literariness of science fiction, um, in part because for whatever reasons, women often come to SF with um, a sense of characterization that's not always present within the genre um, and innovative ideas about how to, how to do that. So it sounds a little bit like that's part of what other people see in it as well, right? That kind of literariness. Because um, Marie, I'm with you. The early stuff is written in such a way that's so different. Like the literary expectations for pulp science fiction were very different, right? Than yeah, it was all about the ideas. Have. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I've found that's been a real challenge when I was putting together The Future is Female for Library of America. Library of America is dedicated to preserving the best, right, of American fiction, whatever that means. But it did not always mean whatever was the considered the best in the pulp magazines. And we would have such interesting arguments about it. I'd be like, the story has to be in there. And they're like, no, but it's written in this way that, that makes us cry. And it's like, but it was the number one story for like five months. And they're like, we don't care. It's and it, it was, you know, it was really interesting um, to have those debates and to sort of try to come to some sort of a median about what could be a compromise in terms of something we might all recognize as worthwhile fiction. So we have a yeah. comment here. Oh, cool. Fiction is emotional history, um, how we felt about our time as it unfolds. It is always worth yeah. reading the old stuff. Very true. Yeah. And honestly, I was when I was thinking about answering this question, the answer I prepared in my brain before talking was, well, I read the old stuff to steal ideas um, <laughs> because That's good. There's, there's a certain freshness um, to the early pulps that, and even the late pulps. I mean, stuff that I was picking up from the 70s and even the 80s where there's just like, wow, you know, there's there's a, 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 a naive wonder and an expectation of just, I feel like our genre was our genre got a little um, down on itself in the 90s and the 2000s where we started doubting that we could predict the future. Um, and it's nice to go back to a time where people were just like saying, you know what, rocket skates, we're gonna have rocket skates. I see no problem with this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and I think there's this idea that, I mean, I, I think we have to distinguish between pulps and what came after, right? Because by the 50s, yeah. they weren't making magazines on pulps. Right. I think people have this idea that any science fiction before a certain date, whatever it is, is somehow wrong, immature, poorly written. And I would give them pilgrimage by Zena Henderson and, and ask them to come back to me. So okay. there's plenty. Ted Sturgeon said it right. Right. Ninety percent of everything is crap. And I would say that about today, too. We have more stuff being produced today. So we probably have more good stuff overall. But there's plenty of crap being made today as well. And so I, I don't think it's fair to the past any more than it would be fair to the present mm -hmm. to say that, well, everything sucked back then. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm currently rewatching DS9. Mm -hmm. And, yes. <laughs> and um, got to the episode where Benjamin, Benjamin Cisco is thrust into a, a dream by the prophets. And he is a science fiction writer. And I are we on the stars? Yeah. yeah, great episode, and I haven't watched that one in years, and it made me think of um, the short story Lisa that you put in your book, um, "All the Colors of the Rainbow." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because he, he, you know, he wanted to publish a story. Why can't I publish my story? I'm yeah. black. He should be black. This needs yeah. to happen. This is the future. Yeah. It's a possibility. Why don't you understand that if this is a possibility? Yeah. And I remember you talking about how in "All the Colors of the Rainbow." they instead of having black characters but they were green right right but then literally at one point like one of the characters who's harassing them calls them green negroes so like yeah. lest you miss the point you know yeah. Lee bracket was nothing if not ham-fisted when she felt like it right yeah. i mean she was often deft but she could also just smash a point into you like nobody's business so yeah, and you know, I mean, I think that's interesting, right? Because we know that black people were writing and publishing science fiction, mm -hmm. um, you know, from literally the moment America is, uh, it, before even America it becomes the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, until uh, Delaney and Butler start publishing, but it's really not until the, the, the sort of successes of the civil rights movement and, and the beginning of like the black power movement, the black arts movement, that mm -hmm. you really see black people publishing in the community, so. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting, I think, to try to watch uh, white authors earlier in the genre writing about race. Um, sometimes they do a really killer job, like because some, some sometimes it's super racist and horrible, and then sometimes it's really uh, it, 
A plus for effort, but kind of like maybe a D for execution. <laughs> but yeah. then there are some stories that do it, right? And I think Brackett is enough of a skilled author that she can take a, a theme and run with like a really obvious story and like yet in, infuse it with so much power. And in a way that for those of you who are thinking about the revival of the civil rights movement right right now with the Black Lives Matters movement, mm -hmm. I think that it's worth rereading mm -hmm. some of that older stuff as white members of, of the community were indeed attempting in their own way to come to grips with the civil rights movement and, and do the right thing. Yeah. There's uh, actually a there's I think a novel or a novella by by uh, Mac mm -hmm. Mac Reynolds, which was called like Black Man's Burden. I haven't read it, but it's on Project Gutenberg and it's on the list. Is it the Tracy Sherman book White Man's Burden? Are you sure that is is or is it or is it? It might be a Mac Reynolds rewriting it's, of it. It's a Mac Reynolds. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Because I know there's a 1920s book by uh, Tracy Sherman, who was a doctor who wrote this one book. And it's um, it's a future where after World War III, Africa is the only country, uh, continent that keeps their shit together. And wow, they awesome. keep building civilization and they dome over Africa because they don't want like the white barbarians in. And the whole That's book is like cool. a white guy from Amer America comes to Africa to try to like figure out how to get his country back on track, basically. So, oh, yeah. But yeah, I, I have no idea how that, I didn't know about the Mac Reynolds story. That's so interesting. Probably riffing on it, yeah. Probably, probably. Mac, the Mac Reynolds oh, Black Africa. Yes. The uh, the Mac Reynolds yeah. Black Africa series is a bit problematic. Um, oh, what, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I mean, it it's okay. Um, but the thing about Mac Reynolds is he did travel the world, um, mm -hmm. so he knew a bit about what he was talking about. But for oh, the most cool. part, this idea that you had to have Black Americans go to Africa to save it from itself um, right. was was a bit. Uh, was a bit difficult. You know, I'm going to say for what it's worth, there are black science fiction authors who posited the same thing. And I think the famous example of that is George Schuyler's Black No More and Black Empire from the 1930s and 40s, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. Schuyler was a uh, actually a conservative journalist, a conservative African-American journalist who like ran with a lot of political bigwigs. But he wrote this like radical black military uh, sequence that was published in the um, the Black Pittsburgh newspaper, I think it's called The Inquirer, I'm forgetting right now. And it imagines a future where like black people, they're just like, we're done. And they all like, they team up together and they compile all of their genius. And they, I mean, and they just take down the world. Like it's so fast. Like, they, they invent fax machines. They invent cures to all our major illnesses. They invent aerial warfare. They invent biological warfare, like really effective. And they like, they take out America and then they take back Africa. But it's all these uh, Afro diasporic black people. They go back to Africa and make it their home base. And they have to like teach the Africans how to be modern. So, mm. you know, it's a really interesting story that, um, just so just to make that point that yeah. that white white Europeans were not the only people having those fantasies that you saw African Americans thinking that way as well sometimes. You know, so, um oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marie. No, no, I was just crap, lost my lost my train of thought. I'm but so sorry. I was gonna say when I was when I was working on my statistical survey, the one thing that continually frustrated me was that I couldn't use a database to to, to statistically analyze whether or not a name was minority. I couldn't. Mm. There's I no couldn't, way, right? There's no way. Um, yeah. Occasionally I would come upon like an Abramov, you know, Shulman or whatever, who was publishing as Adams. Good Smith, Irish name. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But right. yeah, and, and yeah, it's, it's right. There's gotta be so much history because, and in my, yeah. in my data, there's so many one hit wonders. There's so many names of Yes, people who yeah. only published one story, and we know yeah. nothing about them. Exactly, I found so many, many of those too. Many black sure writers do that. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. have a couple more audience um, comments. Um, Futures female two stories. I think for these times, Contagion um, and the Miracle of the Lily. Yeah, well, right, Contagion. For those of you who've read it, it's about humans who go to a uh, another planet and they they find uh, other colonists who had been there for a while and it turns mm -hmm. out they have been contaminated by a virus on that planet that actually remakes everyone as the same person. There's only one genetic type of human who can live on that planet. So everyone gets remade. They, they catch this um, illness and they're all remade as the same strapping, good looking, like 
like yeah. Amazonian, yeah. like man or woman, depending on their yeah. gender, but they all have red hair and copper eyes and they're super fit. And, and it's really a cool story because it's funny at first, the men get contaminated first. And as all of the like geeky guys on the ship become like this hot redheaded, like guy, all the women are like, Jamie this Fraser. Isn't so That's bad. Basically. Yeah. They're like, yeah. yeah, they're like, oh, that, that, that just couldn't work. But then once they start changing and losing their identities, they're like, nope, no way, not a good idea, but it's too late. So that's um, yeah, that that's sort of fear of, of change. And right, even though this is not a disease that would transform us like that, <laughs> I think of Clay's arc too, if you want a really crazy story that transforms people, right? Yeah, um, Miracle of the Lily, that's Claire but, uh, Harris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, an that's an environmental story. That's and, an yeah, environmental so. story, and I think it's fascinating. The, it's uh, weird. I think it really plays into the um, 1920s, first, first woman to publish under her own name, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. although she spelled it C-L-A-R-E, which was a more androgynous spelling. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, but was that, was, that was her birth name, though. So that's her parents' yeah. fault and not hers. So <laughs> No, her, but her birth name was C-L-A-R-R. -R. Oh, had, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, she changed it. But oh, but, but, but it's yeah. a good story. And I think that it ties in, and it ties into like most science fiction does with the anxieties of the day. In the 1920s, industrialization was going gangbusters, right? And cities... People were moving to the cities and the cities were growing huge. Yeah. So it has that idea of a global city that has taken over the entire planet, which then, you know, decades later, Osmov must have picked up and said, you know what? That sounds great, actually. <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, Lisa, I wanted to ask you, I know why I made Rediscovery. Why did you start your Futurist Female Project? So let me see here. So The Future is Female actually came out of an earlier book I had worked on um, called Galactic Suburbia. And that's more of a traditional scholarly monograph. And it was more of a proper recovery. And uh, the question that drove that book was, what is the, what, what, are, what were women doing in the science fiction community between waves of feminism? Because we always talk about uh, women's science fiction in relationship to feminism. And of course, women are important architects of feminist science fiction, but they do write lots of kinds of science fiction. And even someone like Joanna Russ, who is a, was a devout feminist science fiction author, wrote other kinds of fiction. And, you know, and what I found was, A, lots of women have been writing science fiction all the time. Um, Gideon, my numbers come out a little bit higher than yours. I find 10 to 14 percent. But I also was looking at editors and artists and um, science journalists. And if you can include the science journalist, it, it brings the numbers way up because there were a mm. lot of writing nonfiction. Sure. It does. Yeah. I, I, I have yeah. been keep I've been keeping track of the women in science fiction since I started this in fifty eight yeah. or two thousand thirteen okay. for you people. And yeah. um and in fact it's gotten only worse. So nineteen fifty eight was kind of a breakout year for women. Uh three women were included as most prom uh, as, as promising new writer uh for Hugo Awards. Um, and then over the last just couple of years, it's been terrible. Like 5% of the stories are written by women. Out of out of the seven magazines, two stories will be by women. Um, Cell, uh, Cell Goldsmith, now, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, now, now mm -hmm. Lolly. Um, she just, from my perspective, 1965, she just stepped down from the helm of Amazing and Fantastic. Uh, so while there are uh, women on the editorial staff of some of the magazines, there are no women editing science right. fiction magazines. So I have no doubt that over over your broader span, uh, women make up more of it. But in 1965, it's dismal. Mm -hmm. So let's go, let's go over real quick. Um, Gideon lives each day like it's that day in 1955, right? 65. So, 65, sorry. So every time a new something new is released to him, it's because it came out at that moment in 1965. Right. So, yeah. So it's very contextual. Yes, that's really interesting to hear that um, because you know, I mean, you see something similar at the beginning of science fiction history, where there's a, a lot of women in very early on, and especially rolling with Gernsback and Lassiter because they right. are very feminist friendly um, and just open to uh, political experimentation and literary experimentation. But then, right, and so women have a good run for that first five or ten years, and then the minute that feminist backlash hits America. And the feminist backlash boys led by like Campbell and um, Orland and Tremaine to a certain extent, 
um, start to become editors who are shaping things, a lot of women leave. And, and there's actually a lot of reasons women leave at that time period, in part because they get fed up with those guys, in part because Lilith Lorraine got upset with the commercialism of the genre. She thought it had gotten really crude and crass. And um, so you see people leaving for the rise. And also a lot of women were just like, screw it. You know, like I can sit here and be annoyed by you or I can like go have a different job and have kids and be happy. So hmm. um, but, uh, some of them came back later on, right? Like Leslie Stone, one of the great early feminists, she came back in the sixties with the revival of feminism because like there was that moment where it felt more open again, I suspect. Um, and FNSF, uh, the magazine, um, had a solid 10% yes. female in its covers, although there is a dip right around 1963. You mean when Avram Davidson was running the, the oh, magazine man. and all of a sudden women disappeared. But they come back um, right. and although there's another dip in the 70s, um, what, what I found interesting was when I compared the statistics for the different magazines, I compared Astounding Slash Analog to Amazing Stories, Galaxy, FNSF, and Asimov's. And um, the weird thing was watching these waves, but FNSF definitely is an outlier in the, in the when they start, yeah. they start really strong. And uh, somebody told me that Anthony Boucher, is that how his name is pronounced? They said Anthony Boucher and his, his army of housewives. <laughs> yes. Referred to. And it was 10%, come on guys. <laughs> but a lot of the women who published with him specifically took on the persona of the housewife. And there were like, you know, really good strategic literary and political reasons to do that. Like mm -hmm. the housewife author was a, a thing in the fifties as I'm sure Gideon can tell us about. So, right, like that's how people like Shirley Jackson really made their money was writing like housewife heroine humor in the slick magazine. So there was, um, to take on that persona would have made sense. And for Bowser to mobilize it would have made sense, just like the way uh, Gernsback had done in the 20s. Like when housewives reinvented themselves as technical beings, he's like, science fiction, so hip, even housewives write it, you know? So the housewife, I think, is actually a figure you see a lot come and go in science fiction. These days, it's the house husband. And I, I, for I think, any of you who talk to science fiction writers who are guys who stay home, you'll know what I'm talking about. I, I think it's interesting you, you, you talk about the like disassociation that. of women writing science fiction from the feminist waves. Because when I started this project in the early 50s, we were definitely between waves. Um, yeah. I read an interesting article about how about the time between 1950 and 1965 is this strange bubble. And it's the only time when you could have this situation, the nuclear family with the guy doing everything and the woman staying home being the house, the guy doing the, the financial everything, the woman doing the supporting and having the kids. And that really was only feasible in the post-war boom and the technological boom, the, only that 15 year period. And of course the science fiction that I've read and the stuff that's in rediscovery is all from that era. So it's between yeah. these waves of feminism. Yeah. And yet even then there were 36 women at least writing science fiction at the time. Um, I recently did an event in Facebook and I said, hey, who are your favorite vintage science fiction authors who are women? And it was always Ursula K. Le Guin, Anne McCaffrey, Mary Shelley, Lee Brackett, maybe, maybe Andre Norton. And then it just sort of petered out. Yeah. And very few people could name anyone else from that time. Uh, yeah. Two people mentioned Zena Henderson. I said, thank you so much. Ooh. There are so many and they've all been eclipsed. And I'm yeah. not quite sure why, because so many of them wrote so many great things, so, and that's why we started Rediscovery to find them. Right. Well, it might be it might be a, a lag in in the reprinting and what stories get chose to be reprinted um, in the and anthologized. Yeah, I think that is it, and I think that you know women through the history history of science fiction, if you guys want to hear my big theory, and it, it doesn't mean to sound paranoid, but it's like, I actually think this is really what's happened, because I think about this all the time, right? Because as, as Gideon knows from living in the 1950s, like, those women were a big deal when they were there. Like, they may have only been 10% of the community, but like, they were a well-known and well-respected and well-awarded 10% of the community. Like, people would stop... Um, the woman who wrote Contagion, Catherine McLean on the street, like scientists would stop her and be like, you're Catherine McLean. Like they were kind of celebrities in their own way. Um, but I think that um, Marie is right. And that, that often women have been the victims of anthology practices and trends. And 
We know this is true that the first generation of women in the pulps were, were pretty consciously killed off by that first generation of anthologists. We have anecdotes where we know women were um, considered for the anthology and then taken back out once it was revealed they were women. Mm. So, so that's kind of a yucky story right there. Um, and we know that. But then I wonder how much those women who wrote the housewife stuff in the 50s haven't been, I don't want to say victims, but uh, the unfortunate, likely they've been sidelined in some ways by the revival of feminism. Because if you, look at, like, if you think of Joanna Ross as the person and like, um, and Virginia Kidd and uh, Pamela Sargent as the people who sort of uh, built feminist science fiction and built the feminist science fiction canon, obviously when they go back and look at the history of women's science fiction, they were looking for stories that looked like feminism and mm. they understood it in the 70s. So when you do that, you construct a very different history than when right. you know, what did women write. And Russ herself admits this. In one of her essays, she's like, women in the 50s were everywhere and they totally improved the literary quality of the genre, but like they couldn't write women. And, and to which I haven't, you know, I would love to have that conversation with her, but you know. They, they couldn't They couldn't write Joanna Russ's mm -hmm. type of book. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that right there, that, that speaks volumes is I think that it was so important in the seventies to reconstruct that feminist tradition. And I am not at all denying the importance of that, that it meant certain other people got sacrificed and we've just never picked them back up. In, in other words, there it's, lots of people are complicit in the idea that women's science fiction started in the early 60s. I think so. Don't you feel like that as you're telling me yourselves, your experiences interacting with people, like they're excited. If they get back to Le Guin or Norton, they feel like they've gone into yes, deep. The, that those are our, those are our literary um, foremothers. We, we yes. started it all. Well, or if we leave Le Guin, that's the truth, because that yeah. certainly was like the Kool-Aid she was selling. Um, and I mean that, <laughs> oh my gosh, she's been as science fiction's best ambassador to the world. I am certainly not critiquing that, but but she did certainly have a sense that science fiction began with her. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that in the Norton anthology of science fiction that she edited. Like, it literally doesn't begin until 1968. Like, it drove people insane. They're like, what do you mean science fiction didn't begin until 68? And she came on the scene in 1962. So I, I, because of the way I do things, I actually keep myself very um, naive of what's to come. So when I discover a name, it's exciting. And I had never read any Ursula K. Le Guin until I read her first story in Fantastic 1962 called April in Paris. Um, and I loved it. I loved it so much that we gave it a galactic star. I rated it five stars. It was, it was one of my favorite stories of the year. But from my perspective, she was just a promising new author among dozens of women science fiction authors. Um, so yeah, she didn't invent anything. She she did great things, I, I understand. I'm only in 1965, I, she's written her first Earth Sea stories. Um, she doesn't write anything that's worse than three stars. So she's a good writer, um, but she has not she has not stood out above everybody else. And I certainly, if I was to recommend people from the era, I'd be talking about Catherine McLean and Margaret St. Clair and Zena Henderson and certainly Roselle George Brown, um, yes. who probably would have be remembered better if she had not sadly passed away when she was only 41 in 1967. Um, and I will tell you, I this is shameless plug, but also just because I'm a fan. Um, Journey Press, which is my publishing house, has an exclusive contract with Roselle George Brown's son um, to republish Sybil Sue Blue next year. Uh, and oh, probably wow. other Roselle Brown stories. So she is going to come back and we're going to bring her back because she is amazing. Um, talking about the housewife writer, the late 50s right. stuff she wrote was right. very much in that vein for the most yeah. part. Um, but by the early 60s, she's doing her own things. And this the idea that women can't write women, um, that is ridiculous. Oh, Sybil Sue is like an amazing character. That's really exciting to hear. So mm -hmm. glad, glad to hear you'll be bringing her to us in the future. So um, why are the why aren't these books staying in print? Mm. <laughs> why aren't any uh, books from back then staying in print? Our <laughs> crappy copyright laws, which I could spend forever talking about, but I'd rather let other people talk right now. I mean, there's yeah, there's copyright laws. There's a question. Of, I mean, decisions are made by publishing houses, right? And um, I think I've heard I've heard many people talk about how. Like, oh, they said they already had a woman author or, oh, they already had a minority author. Um, they only needed one, you know, to check the box. Um, I think that's changing. It's a good thing that it's changing, but certainly all the way into the 90s, which are the formative reading years for, for me, there was a lot of that 
you know, our, our house only has the one female author going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, right, there's just the difficulty too that that science fiction is a, it's a living genre, and every year, literally, there is more produced like in that year than probably has ever been produced in the past. So there's such an exponential amount of stuff that I think clearly there are classic authors of both sexes, generally male, but also some female who always get reprinted. But it's often hard to find books in reprint, and I mean books that you would expect to be in reprint, just like old is not cool right um, i need to talk i need to walk back what i said because there's a lot of really good women in the 90s but i think part of it is yeah, yeah like you have the superstars right sometimes around 20 years after the genre um for whatever reason we we decide on a canon and yes. the members of that canon are what get reprinted and it's yeah. it's what happens Marie, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I always tell my students that there's this like sea change every 20 years where we kind of reinvent the canon and the rules for good science fiction. So mm -hmm. that's sort of my gut, my gut feeling as well. And the idea that before a certain time, the science fiction isn't worth reading because it's poorly written and the predictions are bad and, mm -hmm. and, and whatever. Um, but I would, but I would say the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's so not true about the predictions. I have a story about that, but you go on. I want to hear your story. I want you to finish your sentence, though, and I'll tell my story. Uh, well, I, it, was, it was a little more than a sentence. So um, I've, I've done panels at conventions specifically regarding copyright law because it's my bugaboo. And I was so happy that the public domain finally moved this year. So now things from 1924 are in public domain. So now you can do that cover of Yes, We Have No Bananas that you were itching to, to do. Um, but one of the things about Galactic Journey was once we got to 1964, all of a sudden everything we were review reviewing wasn't in the public domain anymore. So before 1964, there was about an 80% chance that whatever we were writing about was in the public domain because of the way copyright laws were. It was 28 years in the copyright and then they could renew it for another 28 years. So 56 years total, which is reasonable, right? You write your book, you have your rights until you die and then you're done. And if you don't care enough about your book to renew in 28 years, okay, everybody else gets it. 1964, because of the 1976 Copyright Act, and then later because of Sonny Bono, um, now it takes 95 years for something to go into the public domain. So because of that, any science fiction from 64 onward is going to be almost impossible to reprint. You have to either you have to find the heirs, which is not easy, um, and so so that that has created this deficit of fiction. This just valley of death from 1964 to modern to, to this 20 year horizon you're talking about. No one's printing any of it because no one can and no one's figured out how to make a buck at it. I have, um, but it takes some work. Anyway, what's your story? Lisa? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, but I agree with you. First of all, I just want to say, yes, that is utterly a challenge. And it's something that I know that I've discussed with my editors at Library of America, as we've discussed a sequel to The Future is Female, is that um, people are excited about it. We're talking about ready to go, but we understand that there's going to be this massive issue with copyright. And Library of America, they they preserve American history. So they usually deal with things that are off copyright. And this is even for them, a huge publishing powerhouse, kind of uncharted territory. So I agree with you that that, that also prevents some republication of stuff. That's a great point. So I think that stuff prior to 1950, 1960 feels old for a lot of reasons. Like stylistically, it's very different, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that, as you say, it's difficult to reprint uh, financial, for financial reasons. So my story, what was my story? Um, I don't remember why it was relevant. Oh, prediction, right. So I don't, I don't think science fiction predicts things, you guys, it extrapolates, right? right? Marie told yeah, me I'm yeah. right, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and. But but I, I agree with like what you were saying earlier that I feel like pulp science fiction was bolder in its predictions and it was willing to talk about the future in these crazy ways. And so I wanna draw together what Gideon's talking about and what you had mentioned earlier um, and what drove my initial question is, um, there's this one story I've been thinking about a lot lately by Leslie F. Stone called The Letter of the 24th Century. And is it in any of the books I've republished? It might be in, I'd have to go, I don't remember my own books. Isn't that terrible? Um, write a new one. We'll be ready. <laughs> I, no, I don't think we've ever published this one, actually. It's a two-page short story. It's the best utopia in the world because it's only two pages. You know how utopias are really long and boring? 
not Leslie Stone. In two pages, she writes the funniest and most prescient utopia. So she wrote this. For those of you who don't know, Leslie F. Stone was an early science fiction writer. She was a pioneer in the genre, started publishing in 1929, was I think the second woman to publish a science fiction novel. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then did a lot of firsts, uh, first story, told from the perspective of aliens, first story told from the perspective of a female, first story told from the perspective of a black character, all kinds of good stuff. And she inspired Isaac Asimov to become a science fiction writer. So that's a very cool story. But anyway, in a letter to the 24th century, it's a story I teach all the time in my fiction class. And I've been thinking it about lightly because it's about a guy, he's in the 24th century and he finds a bunch of old science fiction magazines in his basement from the early 20th century. And he thinks they're hilarious. So he writes a letter to his friend who's an archeologist. And he's like, dude, you gotta check out these magazines because they had the most ridiculous ideas about what the future would look like. He's like, they thought like there'd be rampaging robots and aliens would take us over and like we'd be brains and bats. And then the story is like, haha, look how wrong they were because what really happened is we took all the medical and technological advances of the 1920s and ran with those. And now we have a utopia where like um, disease has been vanquished and women don't die in childbirth and everyone has enough money and food. And, and, and this is the reason I teach the story, everyone lives on the internet. Because in 1929, Leslie Stone imagined a future where people would have television radio and television radio would be in everyone's houses and it would connect the world and they would use it to do politics, get their culture and get their education. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's a cool story and it's prescient under any circumstances. But in a moment when we really are getting our education, culture and politics at home, it has a kind of resonance. Right. And. Um, I just, so it feels very predictive. And my students are like, how could this story have guessed this? And so we go back and we look at the history of television and they figure out, okay, you know, uh, Gernsback was involved with early television experiments, still enrolled with Gernsback. She wrote about the things he liked, you know, good extrapolation. Um, but then- Also a thousand monkeys with a thousand typewriters. Exactly. Well, but then as my students point out, there's a line in the story about how they got their world. And they get their world because no one wants to be out in disease ridden crowds anymore. And my students are like, wow, that seems very interesting. And we look at the date of the story and it was written a decade after the Spanish influenza, which oh. Stone had grown up through. And she grew up in Pittsburgh, as my students noticed, which had the highest mortality rate of any American city because they did not practice social distancing. Mm -hmm. well, so. Marie, you're gonna say something? Well, sorry, that's just- No, no, I was gonna say, on the, on the subject of predictability, and I think that we do a disservice to the genre when we get wrapped up in that. And I think part of it is just that people love to complain on the internet that they don't have a jetpack. Um, which, where is my jetpack? You would burn but your food. You just burn your food. Well, but, <laughs> um, you know, as a writer of hard science fiction, um, sometimes I think I surprise people when I'm like, I don't invent anything. Like a lot of what I write is based on last month's Wired article, you know, or a scientific paper that I read of stuff that, you know, is real. That Thank you, Larry like Niven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had, and, we had a question. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. And people say, people, another thing that was popular to say, I think it was said much more often when I was younger, was everything has been invented. Um, but what's really great is when you go back in time and you read uh, a science fiction magazine from the 30s and there's a letter to the editor complaining that everything has been invented. I love that. I love that. I know. It, it's a good reminder that everyone is always very modern. And, you know, I try to remind my students that the way they mock, like, uh, the pulp writers right now is exactly the way other students will mock them in 100 years. And then they all go pale and the conversation shifts. <laughs> oh, we Okay. Question that was up posted earlier: Ratio of female to male authors differ in British magazines. Oh yeah, I'm afraid that I did not study any British magazines. I, my my data is just from American magazines. I will say that the ratio changes over time, um, and that the heyday of women in American science fiction magazines was the 1990s. There's a sharp drop off on the percentage of female names around 2000, but it's building back up now. Uh, Lisa, did you have something? Because I know, I know what my answer is. Uh, I, I, not that much. Go ahead. I have some thoughts, but if you've got a specific answer, go. 
Um, I can only tell you about the brief snapshot of time that I have lived through. So the last five years that we've been covering all of the British science fiction. Um, but it's a wasteland. I think Hillary, Hillary Bailey, um, who is the wife of uh, Terry, uh, um, is it Terry Carr? Uh, one of the, I'm, I'm sure I'm screwing it up because now I'm on the spot. Um, but anyway, uh, she's like the only, she's, there's a couple, but there's almost never any in the British, in the British magazines. What about Naomi Mitchison? She's writing, isn't she? But maybe not in the magazines because she publishes memoirs of a space woman in 62. And she I have is. never heard of her. Oh, you're kidding me. Really? She's very famous and she's married into JBS Haldane's family, or maybe she is one of the Haldanes, but like she's from science, British science royalty hmm. and she's from science fiction. Yeah, you should check her out. And Memoirs of the Space Woman is again an early novel that had a black protagonist. So yeah, um, yeah right, exactly. And from a British author, but yeah, she was my only one I had to pull out. I hadn't thought about Terry Carr's wife. I didn't know she was British, so. Okay, we've got two. Um, one, one thing you might check about the British women is Helen Merrick has a book called The Secret Feminist Cabal, which is about the history of fandom and especially- M Michael British Moorcock, I'm sorry, not Terry Carr, Michael oh, Moorcock. Oh, I was gonna say, okay, Moorcock. that makes more sense. Yeah, that makes sense. But even a lot of the women who published in New Worlds were American expats, not British. So I think that that's really interesting. Um, yeah. So wait, so was there another question that just came across? The oh, um, let me just ask where they can find uh, Leslie. Uh, letter of the 24th century. That's a good question. Let me take a look really quickly right now and see where you can find it. Besides, you can always email me and I can send you a copy of it. Um, it is available. It might be available online. You might want to sleuth around because Amazing is off. Um, Amazing store, I think it was in either Amazing or Wonder Stories, and they are, but it should be off copyright and so online for the. Uh, they no, that's that is not true. Um, no, uh, it's going to be based on the individual wow. story. The only okay. the only magazines well, that are is not the yeah. only magazines that are currently definitely not in copyright are from 1923. So that would be Weird Tales, um, but okay. everything after that has the potential to be in copyright if it was renewed after 28 years. Um, right. So oh, it is yeah. it is unlikely that Leslie Stone's story is in copyright, but it is possible. Um, oh, it's and not. It's not. I can, I can assure you it's not because I've, the, because I've, I've looked this stuff up. So okay. then it, it might be on. copyrighted anything. And Gernsback never copyrighted the first two years of Amazing. So those okay. are all online. Okay. And I bet you he never copyrighted Wonder Stories either. Um, in part because it was very expensive. $25 was a lot of money for copyright back then. And I mean, if you could, if you adjust it, that was a tremendous amount. Most people didn't bother. And people thought this stuff was ephemeral. They thought it was going to be gone. No like one had any idea we'd be looking for it later. Yeah. I love Judith Merrill. Oh, hi, Srikanth. How are you? I actually know this person who just sent that. Um, I love Judith Merrill, and I could go on and gush, but I'll let you guys go first. Um, any of you have thoughts on Judith Merrill? Um, I just really quick. It appears that a letter from the 24th century by Leslie F. Stone was reprinted in the Best of Amazing Stories, the 1929 anthology. So if you can find right. that. Perfect. I think I may have a copy of that. Sorry. I was Googling. Oh, that was good to know. Great. Not enough, yeah, no need to apologize. Right. It's, so uh, much, it's so much easier to do a panel on the internet because you're like, oh, let me look this up. Think about my exactly. answer. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so regarding Judith Merrill, um, she is very important in 1965. Ah. This, this is the year that uh, the anthology wars are about to start because Carr and Wolheim do their science fiction anthology response to the anthology she's been doing. And they got tired of her uh, reaching further afield for her stories and printing li more literary stuff. And they wanted more crunchy science fiction from the magazines. So this is the year that it comes to a head. Uh, Judith Merrill uh, writes some great short stories. One of her stories is in Rediscovery. Um, and uh, and as Isaac Asimov said, you haven't lived until you've been anthologized by Judith Merrill. Um, so she talking about who writes the future, she definitely wrote the story of science fiction for a very long time. She did, and some people, in fact, either accredit or blame her for inventing the phrase new wave as she was beginning to anthologize what would come after um, her and the Futurians, in fact. So right. I, I think Merrill is marvelous, both as an author in the 1950s who really only published a few, like a, maybe a couple dozen stories, but real punchy ones, and, and ones that really invented 
what would eventually become called women's science fiction or, or science fiction told from a woman's point of view, or as um, some unhappy fans called it, heartthrob and diaper fiction. Right. Well, so, and it's funny you but, say that because we just got a letter from someone who's just become a recent uh, fan of Galactic Journey, and he talked about how he didn't discover women penned science fiction for a long time because when he was growing up in the 60s, he assumed that they weren't writing the stuff he wanted to read. Mm. Um, and I suspect that that was a pretty common viewpoint. Oh, that, that's, yeah. a, that's a woman's story. I'm not going to read right. that one. Um, right. So when, when people talk, there's there's sort of this revisionist backlash that says, you know, women were in science fiction all along. And this idea that they were at all discriminated against is clearly wrong. And I won't mm. name the book that advocates this as its, as its theory, but I'm sure you know exactly which one I'm talking about. Um, but obviously there was backlash. And, it, and, and it's amazing just how close Catherine McLean came to never publishing because she got uh, resistance from her family saying, don't publish, uh, science fiction doesn't publish women. And she submitted her story to her first story to analog under her initials because of that. Hmm. And what if we had you know, lost her? Yeah, that's so interesting. Leslie Stone was also discouraged from both from pursuing science and then later from writing science fiction. Um, but she ignored everyone and did it anyway. So it's how that story repeats itself time and time again in, in mm -hmm. some of the same ways. Um, okay, but, so yeah. Susan asks, has Gideon Marie, um, have you read The Future is Female? And um, Lisa, have you read Rediscovery? BT Dubs, Susan is a former student of Lisa. Oh, and what was your favorite of each other's work? Okay, my, my sad confession is that I am only a quarter of the way through The Future is Female. <laughs> Thank you so much for sending me a copy. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, well, I can add in mine. I get a pull. I have the cheat sheets where I have to actually look at the book. Although so. I did love, I liked, I kind of liked the one where like Venus has like the queen aliens and they have all of their. Oh, that's their another Leslie Stone. Story. That's another yeah. Leslie Stone story. Yeah, yeah that, Ola, right. Yes, the first science fiction story told from a feminine point of view and an alien's point of view. Where the aliens win, right? Yeah, I mean, the aliens win, story. and I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, it's the most uncomfortable story because it's like if you identify with the narrator, you probably have to identify across gender and species lines and you end up like having to root for the people who kick the human's butts. It's such a mean story. It's so it's good. It's kind of a mean story. Yeah. I love it. I love it. They love it. Men and they kill them and oh, I'm all right with it. Yeah. The women are such dicks in that story. Mm -hmm. And pardon my French, but there's no other way to explain them. They're horrible. They're vain. They're mean. They're really smart. And, and they think they're beautiful. But they're just Well, evil. they kind of just bad as bad. having soft bodies that are kind of cylindrical. So they really are dicks. Mm -hmm. well, oh, but they're also actually like, but their bodies are oozy. Like eyes come in and out of them. Yeah. They're like little monsters because they can extrude body parts and like when they meet the humans they're like ew god they can't change their form that's so nasty <laughs> it's great it's a really mean story oh and then they like they do like vivisection on the humans they're so mean they're so awful and there's a great point where like the human guys almost seduce the woman and she's like oh, i would have thought that was awesome except men suck <laughs> it's like you're like god this story it's great. um yeah, I have not had a chance to, I have to admit, look at stories out of Rediscovery, but I can tell you, Susan, I use the Galactic Journey all the time. I think it's a marvelous resource, and I want to thank Gideon and all his colleagues across the centuries, or not centuries, but decades, rather, kind of centuries actually now too, actually, we're playing with two different centuries here, um, for, for putting that resource together, and um, it's in my pile and I can't wait. And I'm hoping that as I reboot my science fiction classes for the fall, that we'll be able to include some of this new material. So Which I have- and, and, and Marie, be careful. I might be hitting you up to come talk to my classes. We would be, well, I, I know I would be honored. Um, the, our books are interesting compliments. So your book is, is very broad. It's a huge book and it's got lots of stories in it, but it's also very broad chronologically. So it goes all the way from the 20s all the way to the end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I was hoping that you're going to have more books in the series, because when you cover that broader range, uh, there's only so deep you can go. And so a lot yeah. of these stories that are in there are, are sort of the big ticket stories. You know, these are these are, people know these stories. A lot of them. Ararat is 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 the first, if or, or one of the first people stories. 
Um, most people know uh, Kit reads uh, the new you, which is very cool. Uh, Carpool is pro is uh, I don't know if it's as big as uh, Save Your Confederate, it's Dixie Dollars or whatever, um, but it's, those are big ones. Um, with Rediscovery, the philosophy was a little different. We tried to go very narrow in focus, but much deeper. So we have more of the one hit wonders. Um, we have people like Pauline Ashwell, who was huge at the time. Uh, her story, Unwillingly to School, was nominated for the Hugo. She was nominated for the Hugo as well mm -hmm. as, as promising author. Right. Um, but she's forgotten today. She died a couple of years ago, sadly, right before I was able to talk to her, which was very sad. Um, but there are many, many stories in the book I've read. Um, I, I will confess, I have read the introduction and I've read your author's notes. Um, but to keep myself fresh, I have not read the stories past where I am. Um, yes. But I've read most of the stories in the book already because they cover yeah. the time frame I did. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy Rediscovery. I'd love to know what you think of the stories. I, um, I will definitely. I'm excited about it. I can't wait to, to, to read it. I, I talk to a lot of bookstores and every time I say, hey, if you like The Future is Female, you like Rediscovery. If you like Rediscovery, you should consider stocking The Future is Female because the two go very well together because they complement thematically um, and subject -wise. I'm going to do that right back for you. You know what? I'll help a brother out, man. we got to help each other. All of us, all the SF siblings, we have to help each other out. Well, the, so when I know I know the, the first thing I said was, have you read The Future is Female? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that um, a lot of people that I talk to have heard of the future is female, um, which is cool. Oh, that's good. That's really cool. I'm I'm glad to hear that. I think Library of America did an amazing job um, publishing it. So it's interesting, Gideon, that you mentioned that about the deeper dive. I did do a deeper dive in Galactic Suburbia, which is my scholarly monograph on this subject, and that focuses just on uh, 45 to 65. And so it's a much tighter and deeper dive. And that's where I was able to find people like Alice Eleanor Jones. I, you know, Maria, as you were talking about one hit wonder, she was a five hit wonder, but her five hits were phenomenal, as I'm mm. sure Gideon remembers having lived through that period. Um, she was a big deal, but you know, this, but, you know, Boucher paid her what, 30 bucks a story and the Slicks paid her a thousand dollars for a single column. So we lost her very quickly. Everybody tried to go to the slicks, and then and then they came crawling back. Usually, Philip K. Dick, you know, Ted Stone. Uh, yeah, not 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 um not Alice Ellen or John. No, yeah, we we lost a number of big names to um yeah, Bradbury, right? I mean, he sort yeah. of wobbled off to the slicks eventually. And and early television writers, um, mm. we lost a number. Um, I think Claire Winger Harris actually she moved to California. She wanted to be a Script writer, but I don't no. know if she did no. it. No, she didn't do it. No, that was, but we had a no, number. No. CL Moore did. She and um, Moore did. Kuttner, yeah, Kuttner and Moore went to UCLA on um, his veterans bill money, and uh, they finished up college and they became script writing professors. Actually, at a, I think it was UCLA or UCSD. I can't remember which. Maybe UCSD. And in fact, when yeah. Kuttner died, Moore took over his classes there, and that's why she stopped writing science fiction. She was so busy te professing and writing Bonanza, like, and they paid better. Right. And then she got married. Her second husband didn't want her to write science fiction. It's a really strange and kind of, I think, I can't tell if it's a good or a tragic story. Throw the whole man out. Throw that whole man out. But. Yeah. Uh, Erica wants to know, how do you deal with the difficult or negative histories, topics like mm -hmm. slavery, um, antiquated racial views, when you're looking at saving stories from the past? How do you address these painful uh Past. There are a lot of them too. There's some pretty awful things, especially um, when you look at uh, fear of the other, fear of uh, the East. There's a lot of just yeah. really disgusting depictions of Asian-like aliens and Asians themselves yeah. in the early pulps. Um, you see that in Flash Gordon with Ming the Merciless, right? Like that Ming whole the Merciless is peril, straight right? up yellow peril. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought so it I, yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, I find it really hard. And, and we had this debate, not so much with race, at, because it turned out I was very fortunate when women write about race, they tend to do so in pretty, pretty uh, progressive, in a better way. Yeah. pretty good. And especially because a number of the women I looked at actually had indigenous uh, ancestry. And so it mm -hmm. made them a little bit more amenable to thinking about race in some broad ways. Um, but what I found is uh, sometimes the way gender is handled is really, really difficult. And I'm thinking in particular of 
a story that we included in the future is female and we agonized about it. And that was the, um, oh gosh, what is it? Um, Another Rib, the story by, um, I think it's Anne McCaffrey, is it? Uh, Marion Zibber Bradley and, 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 and a fellow. And uh, yeah. And yeah, well, John D. Well. John D. Well. No, actually, that was a pen name that Juanita Colson was forced to use because play, because the magazine was afraid to publish the story without a male name attached to it. Uh. It's actually Juanita Colson is a famous science fiction author and silk artist, actually. Um, so yeah, that's a story behind it. So first of all, when that story came out, people knew it was edgy and already they were afraid to publish it. And we agonized over publishing it because we were really, it's a very weird take on homosexuality, like really by modern standards, very difficult and uncomfortable. But in the perspective of the times, it, it I think it felt really edgy and progressive. And part of why we wanted to include it is because it was such a controversial story and it had caused a lot of sort of anxiety. And we wanted to sort of try to teach to the debate, but what we didn't realize is how many new anxieties it would provoke in a moment when we're seeing like the, the rise of fourth wave feminism and a feminism that thinks in very sort of complex ways about LGBTQIA identity and I've had a lot of people who are like, I really would love you to just burn that story and never have shown it again. So it's really tricky because, you know, you don't want to repeat the bad old past, but if we don't remember the past, like we relive it. And, and I feel like we're, for those of you who've read Toni Morrison, um, who've read Beloved, that last line where she says, this is not a story to pass on after she spent 300 years uh, pages telling you the story, we're stuck there. These aren't stories to pass on, but I kind of feel like we have to tell them because if we forget, we just relive them. Brett, that's that's, that's excellent. And, and and such a good story to pick as the flashpoint um, because it is, for the time, it is a really interesting story. And if you read it in the context of the time, which is what Galactic Journey is all about, um, it is it is groundbreaking. At the same time, Marion Zimmer Bradley is really tough um, because she was awful. And not yes, only that, not only, it, not only is it, yeah, we knew it in 1964. I'll just say it flat out, Galactic Journey has an editorial policy. We do not review Marion Zimmer Bradley unless she appears in a magazine because she was awful and her husband was awful and the fan community knew all about it back then and there was a civil war in 1964. Marion Zimmer Bradley and her husband, Walter Breen, weren't allowed to come to Worldcon. So this idea that, well, you know, we grew up on Marion Zimmer Bradley and, and she did so many great things for the genre. Okay, but we put our, you know, she has been canceled by Galactic Journey. But with regard to other problematic things, I think you hit it on the head. Women tended to be better about it. Um, C.L. Moore wrote a great story about um, two homosexual pilots in 1962. They also serve, which was kind of a riff on Ted Sturgeon's 1953, The World Well Lost. And yeah. um, and in that one, being gay was actually the secret to winning. Um, they, they made contact with aliens because they were gay. They were the only ones who could do it. So it was a fairly positive portrayal. It was the, one of the first ones. Most people at the time were getting it wrong. And they were getting it wrong consciously and deliberately because as much as science fiction is supposed to look forward, it was kind of a good old boys club. And for I remember just recently, for several months, I was reading month upon month of crappy issues and just this this re reactionary sludge. And I'm like, am I too progressive for the time? Am I an anachronism? And then I would read some ray of light, usually by a woman, but often not. Um, and I'm like, oh, right. Some people even back then got it, knew what was right. There was a reason people were marching. There was a reason Betty Friedan wrote her book. And yes. so this idea that back then nobody got it, no one was woke is ridiculous. And the stuff back then that is like that, that was garbage back then, can be left in the dustbin of history, I think. Yeah, there's there's a real easy, like, since there's a there's this this give get out of free card get out of racism free yes. card that people like to throw like, well, it was for the times. Oh, um, yeah. But you can go back all the way back and see that and actually no, he was you know this was racist at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, this was sexist at the time. Although I have found that some of the most painful and cringy stories are the ones that really thought they were being woke. <laughs> it does happen yeah. sometimes for sure, right? And I mean, oh, bless that's, you. My, that's my feeling about another rib. I think it wanted to be woke and it just does it so wrong, but but it, it but it shows what a community is trying to grapple with. And 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 that community is a reflection of the greater 
the community. Um, do you think there are any good woke stories in the past? Yeah, there has to be. I, 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 I got to think of a good one. Um, but no, there's, I know I've read some really good ones. That I, were, I can like, tell you one right now. Um, so, and we're, and this is, here's a plug. So this month we are republishing Tom Purdom's uh, I Want the Stars, which may be the first science fiction story with a person of color protagonist. I, I, novel, novel. Um, I could be wrong, but certainly I had not read any in the 1950 to 1965 timeframe when I found the story in 64. Uh, and it takes place 800 years from now and the world is a utopia and that's not enough for some people who go traveling the stars looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And it's a great book. Um, it's got uh, homosexuality and polyamory and that's in the background, but it's just sort of there without judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a story of hope and, and why peace is important. And it's just a really neat book in 120 pages that, that does what pages, books with 300 pages couldn't do. Uh, and that's just one example of a woke book. Um, Chip Delaney was writing uh, woke books in 1963, right out of the gate. I wanted um, to see Chip Delaney, but I was like, is he old enough? But that's part of the yes, mystery of his yes. writing is like, yes. it transcends its time. Yeah. When you yes. read Chip Delaney, and Chip oh. Delaney has wonderful sexuality in his yes. stories. And it's just, sorry. Yeah. No, it's amazing. I, I teach I and Gamora. It's the only story I've taught consistently for 20 years now in class. And it's been amazing to watch students' uh, reactions to it change. And again, especially with the rise of fourth wave feminism and a sort of increasing uh, fo uh, interest and focus on trans rights, students are embracing that story in ways right now that like, um, I keep meaning to, to let Chip know this, but, you know, because like we're not like great friends, but I want to just be like, yo, we've met a few times and <laughs> my students love your stuff. Holy cow. Oh, and, uh, but it's like every semester, like it was great. Like this semester, we ended up having this amazing discussion about chaser culture, which um, one of my, my trans students had been talking about this and then it ex explained it to other kids and they're like, oh, this is what's going on in this story. And they could map it all the way back into the past about how chaser culture and the exoticization exoticization of like sexual others um, does never go away. And and that was cool. So yes, he was woke and he remains woke apparently according to our students. So just let him know that the future holds good things for him. It holds okay. good things. I, I think that's a great place to, to stop this amazing conversation. You guys have been awesome. Thank you for doing this. And everybody needs to buy a copy of Rediscovery and the Futures Female. We have them in stock. Um, Lisa for sure is local, but if you guys want an autograph from uh, Gideon and Marie, we can do that. I, we could do that. We can do that. I'll sign a sticker and I'll mail it. Yeah. yeah exactly. Hey, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So you don't have to buy the books from us. Um, support your local independent bookstore. I prefer you buy them from us, but it's okay if you go elsewhere, as long as it's an independent bookstore. Um, Gideon, you were mentioning a bookstore that you frequent or before we started? Yes, um, Space Cowboy Books in Joshua Tree is just <laughs> the coolest place. Uh, and unfortunately, they are closed to the public because Jean Paul is, you know, cares that whether we die or not. Mm -hmm. um, but he does have an excellent bookshop.org um, storefront um, that you should go and visit. Max Bax in Cleveland, Ohio has a yeah. online order form. Um, support local independent bookstores. There you go, guys. So yeah, support your indie. Um, yeah. And thank you again for doing this, guys. This has been an awesome event. I would totally be up for doing this again and just listening to you speak for another hour because that was very enjoyable. Thank oh, you. Very thank much. you so much. Anytime. Happy yeah. to chat. Anything geek, it's all good. <laughs> right. All right, guys. Well, good night and thank you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you.